and the weekend is upon us. And we are so happy that you are here with us on Whispering Hope. We just want to spend this time studying God's words. You know, but before we jump into the exciting topic for this week, we have a few questions coming in from our viewers. And so, Pastor Joseph, before we even begin to discuss the questions placed in the chat, we're just going to ask you to petition God on our behalf. Good morning to everyone. I'm going to invite you now to just kindly bow your heads and uh, turn your hearts heavenward as we ask God for his blessings this morning. Loving God and our Heavenly Father, we come this morning giving you thanks and exalting your most holy name. We ask that you'll have mercy upon us and forgive us of our sins. Father, today as we enter into your word, we ask for your Holy Spirit's guidance. May our thoughts be connected with his thoughts and may we rightly divide your word. Father, we pray that you will be with all those who have joined us for this final installment of our lesson for this week. We pray that you will bless them, you'll strengthen them, you'll watch over them, that you allow your Holy Spirit to guide them as well. As we get into this session, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. This week, we're looking at the topic, Beware of Covetousness. And there are some questions coming out of our previous lesson, Pastor Joseph. And so we want to begin with them and for you to shed some light on our viewers' questions. And one of our viewers, Sister Dolores Stewart, she wants to know, I'm wondering if Aiken's family knew of what he did and agreed with him. We know in the end, the whole family was destroyed along with him. So she wants to know if they were part of the plot, part of the plan. Did they really know that Aiken stole and disobeyed? What's your take, Pastor Joseph? There seemed to be no indication that there was collaboration between Aiken and the members of his family to take and hide the, the goods that were taken of the spoils. Uh, one could reasonably ask that perhaps the extent of retrieval that took place, that perhaps it was more than him that was involved, but there seemed not to be that indication. I, I think what we're looking at here is Aiken as the, the head of the family, Aiken as the one who bears oversight for the spirituality of his family, it is held responsible and culpable, but also his family is, is held accountable as well. And it is this, what is referred to as a sin of Aiken or the covetousness that exists. I think God saw a need to eradicate any trace of it from Israel. Again, you know, the story singles out Achan as amongst the entire camp to be the only one who would have gone against God's explicit instruction. Uh, and I believe that there was an attempt there to ensure that there was not a spreading of this disease of covetousness um, amongst the people. And I, and I think that is why his family was affected as well. Well said, you know. <laughs> George Charles, and I think this is a question that we all ask at some point in our lives. Is it possible that sometimes we blame God for our actions? Mm -hmm. Most times people tend to want to deflect responsibility for what they have done. And we see it at the very beginning. Adam blames Eve, Eve blames the serpent. And uh, th there is this tendency throughout, throughout life for us to always want to hitch on blame to somebody else. And I mean, I've heard people blame God that if God didn't allow certain things to happen in their life, then they would not have done so and so. If God didn't bless them with, with, with certain things that they would not have done so and so. If God did not open up opportunities for them, then they would not have done so and so. I've heard people make those kind of remarks, but I mean, I've always contend that there is nobody else to be blamed for whatever you do but yourself. You're the one that made the choice to act on whatever it is that might have come or affected your psyche. Somebody says something harsh to you. 
you have control over yourself you have control over your your hands your feet your mouth in terms of how you react and so you can't blame somebody for what you do you have to take full responsibility for that you might try to justify it but you can't blame somebody because that was your choice and folks do that to god again as i said before whatever the reason you know, somebody else has to take the blame because I am not guilty. And I think, you know, having said that, the best course of action always in terms of how we live is to accept full responsibility for the things that we do, the, say, the things that we say, the places that we go, whatever action we take, because those are worked out and calculated in our minds before we act. Thank you so very much. Beware of covetousness. That's the topic for this week's lesson. It's a warning. Beware of covetousness. Pastor Joseph, when you think of this topic, what comes to your mind? At this time, we're going to pause for a special prayer for Angela Ramsey. She has made a request for special prayers. Um, we're thankful that these lessons have been impacting upon her and that she has come to a realization that you know there's a turning that needs to be made in her life and today we just want to unite with her in talking to god about helping to empower her and continue to guide her as she makes these decisions um, let's bow our heads gracious god and our loving heavenly father today we just want to present our dear sister into your hand today we are thankful for your holy spirit bringing her to the realization that in the past she probably would not have made the kind of decisions that would augur for good stewardship but today after she has studied um, this quarter's lesson you have illumined her you have enlightened her and she's determined to forge forward with changes in her life to be in concert with your desire, your will, and your guidance for her life. And so we ask that you'll bless her, that you'll strengthen her, that you'll allow your Holy Spirit to always be there for her, to guide her, to hold her up, and to show her the right way. And we pray that even as she makes the decision now to follow your principle, that she will see the result of putting God first, putting him at the center of her life and following his principle and, and being obedient to him and uh, being a blessing to others. Grant her your peace, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. When you look at the topic for, for this week, it is a, the sounding of a warning. It's something that you need to be cautious over. There is lurking beyond that point danger that is destructive that is you're going to find it difficult to pull back from and so the label the, the caption that says beware calls you to be alert you know calls you to be focused calls you to analyze calls you to bring all your knowledge to bear on the next step that you're going to take and i think that is what i got from the topic this week all right so we got our memory text and i'm going to ask you just to comment on it it comes from luke 12 verse 15 and it says take heed and beware of covetousness for one's life does not consist in the abundance of the things he possesses luke 12 15 kate shed some light on what Luke is saying here to us, Pastor Joseph? Very interesting expression as Jesus makes the call for us to pay attention and take counsel. Pay attention, give regard, beware. That's what it is. And most times when you hear beware, you really should stop, evaluate, and even avoid. Don't even think to say, well, hey, listen, you know, I can go forward. One of the things I will always remember is that sometimes the guys would warn you that when it rains at a certain time, you ought to be careful about traveling on the road at a certain place because there is a tendency for debris to roll down. And the water might look accessible, but you don't know what, what debris might be in the water itself. 
And so you might go in there and you might get stalled or you might something might hook up on your under part of your vehicle and make it difficult for you while the water continues to rise. And so you need to be careful. But that says don't even venture in, you know, avoid it at all costs. And I think that is the counsel here. Avoid covetousness at all costs. And we'll talk about desire. You know, when a certain kind of desire comes to you, you've got to be careful to shut it down very early because it has the danger of destroying your life. And, and it goes on to say, listen, your life is not about the volume of things that you have. That's not what life is all about. It is not all of your achievements. That's not what life is all about. There are more substantive things about life. Your faithfulness to God, your dedication to your family, your dedication to others. A lot of people today are discovering that there is more satisfaction in helping others than in trying to take care of yourself. And that is what Jesus kind of trying to safeguard us from. Take heed. Because there's more value in giving, sharing, helping, you know, developing others than for you to hoard everything for yourself. Again, we want to thank you for your insight. And on a Friday, again, we look at Achan. And we know in the Battle of Jericho, the instruction was very clear. All the gold was supposed to come into the treasury of the Lord. The gold, the brass, the silver, the iron. And, you know... So many families, so many men were involved in this recuperation of the precious metals. But somehow, it seems as if Achan found himself in a bind where he kept some of this goodly Babylonish things to himself, especially the garments. You know, when he saw that nice coat, he coveted it and he brought it into his house and buried it. And we see that God dealt with a whole nation for one man's action. They lost in the battle of AI because of disobedience of one. And it says a lot to me just how far reaching covetousness can take a nation. And so Paul has some list of and some signs how we deal with money our attitude towards it and we live in a society where so many people seem obsessed with getting rich or die trying and so i'm gonna read for you first timothy 6 to 10 first timothy 6 6 to 10 and then we're gonna have a little discussion to on timothy's warning and it says now godliness with contentment is great gain for we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out. And having food and clothing, with these we shall be content. But those who desire to be rich fall into temptation and a snare, and into many foolish and harmful lusts, which draw men in destruction and perdition. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil from which some have strayed from their faith in their greediness and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. That's a whole mouthful there for us here, what Timothy told us. Now, the question is, talk about some examples of those who because of the love of money, have pierced themselves and others through with many sorrows. I'm sure you can think of a lot of examples, Pastor Joseph. Yes. I think as we look around, and, and one of the things talking about contemporary people is that they're very easily identifiable. But if you look around, there are individuals who they have given up their faith in order to acquire wealth in order to work industries that are conflicting with the faith that they used to practice in order to the working industries that does not allow them to develop and strengthen their relationship with god by observing the sabbath day they get involved in things that 
clearly the Bible calls us against. And in the end, we have seen them. It never really panned out. It's like going to look for gold, but in the end, you don't really get any gold from your pandering. It's like that. And at the end, you see them return to the church and praise God for it. But they come back with that heaviness that they had given up so much and for so long. And here they're coming back without anything to show for it. And they see it as a failure upon their part. And so sorrow and grief afflict them for the remainder of their lives. You know, they're back, yes, but they're lamenting about what they could have done had they stayed. These are examples that just continue to, to show themselves and reveal themselves time and time after. And we seem not to learn the lesson. We, there's always this grandness in our minds that we can do what others have not been able to do before and come out standing on a pinnacle as a demonstration that, hey, listen, if you only follow a certain plan or a, a certain strategy, if you only listen to your star, that you can make it. But we have seen it. We have seen great artists and one of the things people used to use an example is the late gentleman that we call little richard who had started out gotten saved gone to to bible school with an aspiration of becoming a preacher the limelight calls and you should hear his testimony when he came back to the church and i'm saying that yes he might have amassed a certain level of of fame and notoriety but the, the grandness that he sought after didn't really come to him as he thought he would have but even more so when he returned he returned with the pain and frustration of having traded in what would have been more meaningful for him for what turned out to be just a fool's goal shakespeare uh, you know we can always go to him and say hey listen all that glitters is not gold many a fool is life has has sold just by outside to be. When we look at things in life and think that they can be better if only, and God is saying, no, that's not the way it is. The way it is, is to order your life in a particular way and success will come. Slowly, gradually, but it will come. And I always remember, and sometimes I tell this at a funeral, you know, the folks who come, there was this thing about the grand edifice that were built in a particular cemetery. And the folks who come, and what they desire is not to see all these famous men who had ruled nations and ruled countries and ruled cities, but they came to see one, the grave of a lonely preacher who by his life lived had impacted the world, caused religious denomination to be formed and called by his name. And we're talking about C.W., Charles Wesley. And even though his grave was covered over, the story says, with shrubs and weeds, yet people made their trap to his grave. And even in the sight of all the glorious shines that existed. Because when you live a life that's meaningful to Christ, it is impacting and it follows you even to the grave. I know you, you stayed particularly on contemporary people today, but if we just reflect on our lesson for this week, we have mm -hmm. Achan, covetousness, how it played out in their lives to the ruin. We have Judas, when Mary Magdalene poured an expensive gift on her Lord for all that he has done for her. He was in such a tone to condemn her saying why didn't we use this money and give it to the poor and that same night or that same day he betrayed his lord and we have Ananias and Sapphira and so it is very important that we regard our covetous nature you know it's something that if we don't submit to God will take control of us and you know as you've rightly said some as in the case you looked at little Richard, that he was able to come back to God. But all these three biblical examples, they went to Christ as waves, and it stems from being covetous. And so a warning to all of us, is something I would have said before, and something I'm going to always say, covetousness is a sin that is not easily detected. I can be sitting down there and covet you in your nice Jeep, Pastor Joseph, and you don't know. 
but I wish I had it. And in my mind, I'm trying to plot ways maybe to get it from you or to get you to destroy it so that I don't, so that you don't have one and it's not a bother to me. And so I want to also ask, how can we find the right balance? Knowing what we need money to get. Yes, we need money to get by, but not falling into the trap that Paul warns about here. How do we find that balance, Pastor Joseph? But we need money. We can't survive in this world without money. <laughs> Let's be honest. We need it. Yeah. And, plenty, we and, plenty, it. Yeah, and plenty of money is helpful. And I think we have discussed that in our lesson so far for this quarter, that the issue is not having, is not even the volume that you have, but it is your perspective, your outlook on life. So the proper balance is to make sure that you keep God in focus. If God is in focus, nothing else deters you, nothing else troubles you, nothing else lures you away. If God is in focus, you're obsessed more with him than with the things that you see around you or even the things that you have. And so to keep things in the proper perspective, you really need God. It's the second point is not only do you need God, but you always need to put God first. If there are things that you acquire, the things that come into your circle, if there are things that come into your basket, always remember that it's God first. And you treat him and give him that respect. If, if you have that perspective of life, it tames and tampers and tampers your desire to trample others to get things because you understand and recognize that all that you have comes from God and that God will supply all your needs according to his riches in glory. And the second thing is that uh, again, throughout the lesson, we have learned that if we focus on others, seeing ourselves as a, as a tributary or conduit towards the benefit of others, where others that are perhaps less fortunate, others who are in need, others who need opportunities, receive from our hand to have a better experience in life. If we see ourselves that way, rather than wanting, we would always have the perspective of wanting to give, wanting to share. And so those are some of the things that can dampen our desire or balance things off. God expects us to be able to manage what he makes available to us. And I think there is no mistake in Jesus telling the parable of the talents and, and the one who received five and the one who received three, or two and the one who received one. In that parable, the one who receives five and was able to increase on it got a double in other words, he was entrusted with twice as many, as much as he was able to handle before. It's the same with the guy who had two. He was entrusted with twice as many as he had before. And what that parable says is that Jesus is making it abundantly clear that once you manage well, that God will trust you to manage more. And that is where we ought to be able to be focused rather than trying to hold everything for ourselves, build bigger bands for ourselves, have everything else for ourselves, you know, use what we have to empower others so that as they are empowered, it changes our perspective on life and greed doesn't overwhelm us, but rather the charity. Thank you so very much, Pastor Joseph. And we're talking about covetousness. What are other things besides money that we can covet? The Bible, and I want to go to the Bible, the commandment is clear. Don't, don't covet your neighbor's wife. Don't covet anything that your neighbor has. So it, it could be a somebody else's wife. It, it might not be somebody else's wife, but it might be another woman that you, you, you see, or it might be another man that you see, or it might be a job that somebody has, or it might be an educational level that somebody has, or it might be a position that somebody has. There are so many... Covetousness is not limited to, to financial resources. There is the desire always on your part to always be be better than somebody else, always be in a better position than somebody else, always be perceived better than somebody else, always be in a position to have what they are unable to have. 
and there is a proverb that says stolen water is sweet they seem to that seem to be at the back of some people's mind that if they can get something in an illicit way that somehow that brings satisfaction to them and that is why covetousness ought to be shunned like leprosy because it has that capacity like wood loves to eat away at the inside of an individual and eventually destroy them and so those are some of the things that hey listen you can covet as well so you're saying that covetousness can work like wood loves Ah, yes, uh, it eats away at people and, and they do some crazy things in order to, to acquire, possess what they seek. You know, sometimes you see a nice piece of uh, furniture, it looks good on the outside, but the woodlouse has already done its work inside. So, and by the time you discover that it's, it's no good, you got to throw it out. You got to throw it out. And for those of you who may not know what woodlouse is, that's our colloquial term for it. It's termites, eh? Or Jamaicans call it wood ants. <laughs> yeah, so what is the difference between a legitimate desire for something and covetousness? So I want an education. I want to have my master's in education. What is the difference between wanting me personally wanting to have a master's in education and coveting a master's in education? What's the difference? Is there a difference? Talk to me. I would say that a person's desire for self-advancement, self-actualization is a good desire. God himself has promised that he will make us the head and not the tail if we obey all his uh, all his instructions. If we follow the guidelines, we're going to be the head and not the tail. So it is in God's plan that we are on the top. So when we talk about covetousness and wanting to be, we're not talking about wanting to be as something that is bad. We're talking about the attitude that we bring to that desire. So, so I want a master's because it's going to allow me to be more effective in what I do. It's going to allow me to, yes, fulfill my good plans as an individual, my good academically, but it also puts me in a position to be a better teacher or to be a better professional to serve people better to bring more resources and knowledge to, to the job that i'm in i want to broaden my capacity to give more to deliver more to be more effective that, that's a good desire but if i want a master just because somebody else has one that's useless in my estimation you know, I tell people all the time, somebody asks me, somebody keep asking me, why don't you just go and do a terminal degree? And I say, it would be good to be called doctor, yes. And it would be good to be able to widen your scope of knowledge, yes. But at this time of my life, I am more focused on certain critical things for me, my family, and the community that I serve. And so... I look at the resources that I, I would need, perhaps not. I look at how I would deploy my resources and I make the decision based on that. I'm not going to just decide that I want a terminal degree because everybody is around me have, has one and it sounds good. And if, if I'm going to be considered um, to be pastor of a certain church, that I must have a certain title. No, I'm, I'm not going to pursue that for that very reason now if there's a need if there's a need for a person with a terminal degree to be in a certain place and there is that need cannot be filled i might consider say listen let me put myself in a position to be to be there again i'm making the point that if you're doing it for not only selfish reason, but just because you want to one up on somebody, you want to be able to say to somebody, "Oh, I have a, a master's degree as well." No, it, it's it's not going to work. I, again, that very mindset, the very mindset, it's a weird thing. Well, my final question is the reverse of the one that I just asked you. When might a legitimate desire for something? turn into covetousness i know you would have touched it a little bit but just shed a little bit more light for us my desire for something legitimate no turns to covetousness how is that possible and when is it possible 
And when do I detect that I've crossed the line? Yes. <laughs> that, that, that is no longer a legitimate desire. I think that when we get to the point where there's a certain degree of obsession, when we get to the point where there is there is that oh, this I do or or somebody dies, this I do and, and I got to undermine somebody in order to maintain a status quo or, or to get to a certain level, I think that's dangerous. So I hold a, a particular position now within the conference. The constituency got to reevaluate and make choices in the next month or so, or, or two months or so. Do I go um, and condive and collaborate and, and whatever with, with others in order to remain in my position so that others can can hold me there? Do I, do I try to bring other people down so that I can stay there? That's when a desire to do a good thing becomes covetousness, you know? Just trust God that you would have done your best. And if God, if God wants you to be there again, he will have you there again. And that's the other thing about covetousness is that we believe that there's a certain kind of entitlement. You know, we're here, therefore we're entitled to be here. Not recognizing that people have their choices and even though you might have done your best and somebody after you might not be able to do as good as you have done, it is their right to choose who they want to choose. And you have to accept that. But to become all bitter and, and, and so on is to really cross that line into covetousness uh, as far as I'm concerned. To know that, that you have a supervisor or a boss and you're undermining them, undercutting them, and there's always something that you're suspicious about them doing to you or for you or against you. You know, those are areas that you need to pay attention to. We go back to the passage that we, we dealt with earlier on. Little with contentment is great gain uh, and you know the power in that text says that if you're content with where you are and serve well where you are and walk humbly where you are there is something great to be gained and that is the posture that god is calling us to rather than for us to be bombastic grand whatever the other terms are that speaks of grandness no humble yourself and the Lord will exalt you. It might not be where men wants, or what man men refer to as exaltation. But hey, listen, trust me, when God puts you somewhere, even though it seems as if it's a menial task that he has asked you to do, trust me, it's an elevation. And you can always trust God in that. Amen. You know, Pastor Joseph, we're out of time. And the text I was about to use to close, you just quoted it, First Timothy six and verse six but i just want to share this story joke there was this rich man had a lot of money and on his deathbed he said to his wife when i die i wanted to put all of my money in the casket with me i'm going down with my money she so said sure honey sure honey so eventually he died and at the day of the funeral with the casket for the viewing, the casket was open. She went and she pushed something in his jacket pocket. And one of her friends says, what did you put in his pocket? She said, I wrote him a check for all the money in the bank. He can cash it when he gets down there. You know, it's, it's a joke. It's funny. But there are lots of people. That's how they view life. It's all about amassing wealth. And you know, the memory text or the text for Friday, especially 1 Timothy 6, verses 6 to 10, talks about being content. Godliness with contentment is the greatest thing we can have. To be satisfied that God has provided just exactly what I need. And Paul continues to say, for we bring nothing into this world. And we can't carry anything out. And so it behoves us. And whatever it is that we are amassing, whatever it is that we are building, build our characters for eternity. Have a great day. God bless. And see you tomorrow on Whispering Hope.